Hello everyone! In the previous video, we looked at our first quantum algorithm, Deutsch's algorithm, to demonstrate an example of quantum circuits and quantum advantage in action. In this video, we will take a step back from quantum algorithms to discuss open systems and how we describe them via density matrix formalism. In physics, we define an open system as one which is imperfectly isolated from its environment, meaning that it constantly exchanges energy and information with its unobserved environment. In this case, the typical assumptions we made previously no longer hold. In particular, we can no longer represent quantum states by state vectors in all situations. Measurements are no longer orthogonal projections necessarily, and time evolution is also no longer necessarily unitary. In this video, we will focus on the first distinction and talk about how we describe the states of open systems via density matrix formalism. Thus far, we have described states of systems using these kets, or vectors, corresponding to superpositions of basis states. These types of states are referred to as pure states. However, this description does not give us a complete method of describing a system. What do I mean by this? Well, let's suppose we have a bell pair phi plus over qubits a and b. Now I can describe the whole system as the following ket. However, how would I describe just the state of A? Here, A is interacting with B, meaning that it is an open system. So it seems impossible to describe the state of A alone using the state vector representation. So how do we even approach this? Well, consider what would happen if we instead had a product state. Since A is not entangled with B, we can measure B and discard the measurement outcome without changing the state of A. Going back to the bell pair, if we now measure b in the center basis, we force a to be either 0 or 1 with probability 1 half. Note that here it actually doesn't matter which orthonormal basis we use to measure b with, but I'll stick with the center basis just for simplicity. Consequently, it would seem as though the best way to describe the state of a is some kind of classical uniform probability distribution over the states 0 and 1. But how do we even describe such a state? A natural response might be that the state is simply a uniform superposition over 0 and 1, like the plus state. However, this state behaves fundamentally differently from the probabilistic mixture described previously. For instance, if we apply the z operator to the plus state, we get the minus state. However, if we apply the z operator to the probabilistic mixture described before, we still have the exact same state, as the extra global phase on state 1 can be ignored. So, how do we describe it? Well, we can introduce the notion of a density matrix. The equivalent density matrix of a pure state psi is defined as follows. Essentially, it's just a projection matrix, uh, where we're essentially just projecting onto the subspace spanned by this given state. One nice feature of a density matrix, compared to a state vector, is that the redundancy in global phase that happens when we define states using vectors does not exist for density matrices. In particular, you can observe that even if we multiply our state by a phase factor, for the equivalent density matrix, the phase is multiplied by its complex conjugate, which cancels it out. Consequently, there is a wholly unique density matrix for each state for a given basis. Getting back to the matter at hand, we can describe ensembles over pure states, or mixed states, as convex combinations of pure states. Essentially, the coefficient of a given term corresponds to the probability of sampling said state. For instance, for the example of a mixed state I gave before, of the qubit with equal probability of being 0 or 1, we can express this density matrix as follows. You may notice that this density matrix is actually a multiple of the identity. Density matrices that are proportional to the identity matrix correspond to maximally mixed states. This means that we effectively have no information about what the state of the system could be, regardless of how we measure the system. In this case, this means that for any pair of orthogonal basis states that we try to measure with respect to, the state will collapse to either state with probability one half, regardless of the choice of basis. I will discuss this concept in greater detail if I ever decide to lecture on quantum information theory. I should note that the states that compose a density matrix need not be orthogonal. However, for any density matrix, there always exists a representation in terms of orthogonal pure states, which we can get by simply taking the spectral decomposition of a density matrix. Speaking of which, we should discuss the properties of density matrices. Firstly, density matrices are Hermitian, since they are convex combinations of projection operators, which are by definition Hermitian. Next, if a density matrix is a pure state, we have that the density matrix is idempotent, meaning that rho equals rho squared, which simply follows from the fact that rho is a projection operator if and only if rho is pure. 
Since projection operators have trace 1 and row assembly convex combination of them, we have that the trace of a density matrix is always 1. This is effectively a generalization of the normalization condition we have for pure states. Moreover, by convexity, we also have that the trace of row squared is less than or equal to 1, where equality only occurs if and only if the state is pure. For this reason, the trace of row squared is also referred to as the purity of the state. You may be wondering how operations act on density matrices, as before we simply just multiplied the operator directly against the state vector, but now our state is a matrix. Well, let's look at pure states. If we have a pure state psi, its ket representation is simply this, and its corresponding density matrix is simply this. If we now apply a unitary u to our state, we just multiply it directly against our vector as follows. For this new pure state, we have that our density matrix would be given as follows. Consequently, we can see that to apply a unitary to a density matrix, we simply conjugate it. In other words, we multiply rho by u on the left and u dagger on the right. Another important thing to know is that the expected value of an operator with respect to a density matrix is simply the trace of rho times that operator. To see why this is intuitively the case, we can expand rho out in terms of its spectral decomposition and use cyclicity of trace to get this weighted average of expected value expressions with respect to each pure state that makes up our density matrix. Okay, we've talked a lot about the properties of density matrices. We will see more properties as we go on, so I'll leave our discussion here for now. When we are looking at single qubit pure states, we describe the general form of the state of a qubit as a superposition between states 0 and 1 with coefficients alpha and beta, such that the square root of the absolute value of alpha squared plus that of beta squared is equal to 1. Notice that this means that for some real theta, we have that the absolute value of alpha can be parameterized as cosine of theta over 2, and similarly, the absolute value of beta can be parameterized as sine of theta over 2. We use theta over 2 here instead of theta so that we can have theta be between 0 and pi, for reasons that will soon become clear. Since we can ignore global phases, we have that without loss of generality, we can set alpha equal to cosine of theta over 2 and beta equal to e to the i phi times sine theta over 2 for some phi in the range from 0 to 2 pi. Using theta as the polar angle and phi as the azimuthal angle, we can map any pure state to a point on the surface of a sphere of radius 1. This sphere is known as the block sphere. At the top and bottom of the sphere, along the z-axis, we have the z-eigenstates 0 and 1. At opposite ends of the x-axis, we have the x-eigenstates plus and minus. And lastly, as you would expect, along the y-axis, we have the y-eigenstates plus i and minus i, where plus i denotes the plus 1 eigenstate and minus i the minus 1 eigenstate. Consequently, you can see that we are effectively defining some kind of 3D representation of our state based on the poly x, y, z eigenstates. Okay, but where do mixed states fit into the picture? Well, consider the density matrix for a pure state. With some algebraic manipulation, we can show that it is possible to expand out the density matrix in terms of poly matrices and the identity matrix. Interestingly, we can observe that when we factor out one half, the coefficients of the poly operators exactly match the x, y, z coordinates of the corresponding point on the surface of the block sphere. Now consider what happens if we have a mixed state. This mixed state is simply a convex combination of two pure state density matrices. Note that we end up with an expression of the same form, with the only difference being that the coefficients of the vector dotted with sigma, the poly operator vector, is now the convex combination of the points on the surface. In other words, to map mixed states to the block sphere, we simply map the state to the corresponding convex combination of the two pure states that compose it. Since spheres are convex, this means that all mixed states are located in the interior of the block sphere. Furthermore, we can see that if we take the uniform combination of points corresponding to 0 and 1, we get the origin, which corresponds to the maximally mixed state we observed previously. In other words, rho equals i over 2. Hence, points closer to the surface correspond to purer states, while those near the middle are more mixed. So overall, we have that with this parameterization, we can effectively map any point in the block sphere, including points on the surface and those inside the sphere, to any state, whether that's a mixed state or a pure state, and vice versa. So we effectively have a bijection. Okay, so this is all pretty fascinating, but are there any advantages to thinking of states within this framework? Well, as it turns out, there is. 
In particular, all the gates that we apply simply amount to rotations on the block sphere about various axes. In particular, we can rotate points on the block sphere using SU2 rotations. The SUN rotation group consists of n by n unitary matrices with determinant 1. Consequently, SU2 is simply the group of 2 by 2 unitary matrices with determinant 1. This might seem problematic since many of the unitary gates we apply, such as the poly matrices, have a determinant that is some other phase factor that is not 1. In particular for the poly matrices, the determinant is minus 1. However, since global phase does not change a given state, we can always multiply these operators by an appropriate phase factor to get an operator with determinant 1 that is, that is in SU2. SU2 rotation matrices themselves are generated by the x, y, and z poly operators. In particular, we can take a complex exponential of any of these multiplied by i theta over 2 to get rotation operators rx, ry, and rz which each rotate about the corresponding axis. In general, we can represent a rotation about axis n, where n in this case is a unit vector, by angle theta on the block sphere as follows. As an example, the Hadamard transform h corresponds to a rotation about the diagonal axis 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 2, by angle theta equals pi, up to a global phase factor. We can also express this rotation in terms of rx, ry, and rz as follows again, up to a global phase. In general, any SU2 rotation matrix can be created via composition of Rx, Ry, and Rz gates. Altogether, we introduce density matrix formalism and gain some geometric intuition on how mixed states relate to the pure states we have discussed up until this point. In the next video, we will continue our discussion on open systems by talking about the Schmidt decomposition and multipartite systems. I hope you enjoy this video, and I will see you next time.